If there's one thing hard to find in the institutional cluster of the Longwood medical area, it's the healing tranquility of open space. That's the backdrop for a tenacious campaign to save a half-acre patch of green on the campus of Boston Children's Hospital, the Prouty Garden. The hospital wants to eliminate the garden to make room for expansion. Recently, the hospital agreed to build a rooftop garden and produce some new open space at other locations. To talk about the campaign for the garden are two participants, a landscape architect and member of the group Friends of the Prouty Garden, Tom Payne, and the mother of a former patient at Children's Hospital, Beecher Grogan. Thank you both very much for being with us. Thanks for having us. I, I want to start with, with Tom Payne. Uh, walk us through this little garden and, and tell us why is this such a big deal? Well, the Prouty Garden has been there for 50 years and it is beloved and renowned the world over as perhaps the pioneering example of a healing garden. A healing garden. I use that word healing uh, uh, with emphasis. It has places of incidence, places where you can get off and be on your own, where you can grieve, where you can have fine privacy, and yet it has space. It's immersive. You're surrounded by nature. You have a tall tree overhead. You have wonderful grass you can roll around on. You don't feel like you're about to roll into somebody else. You can find your own space within that space. And it has, it's outdoors. It's not, uh, and it's, it feels secure and peaceful. It's a place where a young child for whom the world is a scary place when, it's, when it consists of a hospital of recent memory, uh, where a young child can feel secure, understanding the elemental things, the sun, the sky, a, a nice gentle breeze, a beautiful tree overhead. And so it has that expansive space uh, and that, that is not being replaced in what is proposed either on the roof or at ground level with space that is somewhat green but is certainly not a healing garden by any definition of healing garden. Richard Grodin, uh, you spent a lot of time at this hospital with your daughter. There was a period when you could not get access to the garden, then there was a period when you could. What's the difference? Right. Uh, the difference, you know, we weren't able to access it because they were doing work on Dana-Farber and so we weren't allowed for safety reasons to go outside. And we actually lived in the hospital for six months in 2002. And if you can imagine, you know, if, if anyone kept their child inside for six months, that would be considered abuse. Um, we understood the reasons we couldn't go outside because it was for safety. But uh, my daughter unfortunately relapsed, and so in 2004 we were back, and the garden was then reopened. And I got to really see the difference between hospitalizations where you're stuck inside for months and weeks on end, and hospitalizations where we could get outside every single day. And it made a profound difference in my daughter's mental health, and I think physical and fear, spiritual health as well. Uh, how would you explain the difference? The difference, well, you know, if you can you imagine being inside for six months? I mean, my daughter, we lived on a farm. She was a, a tomboy. She was a nature kid. She loved to catch frogs. And to take that child overnight, she had an overnight diagnosis of a very um, rare form of leukemia. And her treatment was so severe, we had to stay in for months on end. So if you can imagine taking that child out of her natural element and saying, you're now going to be in the sterile environment in a hospital where you will not be able to have sunlight, fresh air, you won't have dirt under your feet. You won't be able to roll around in the grass. It was, it was really difficult for us. And the view outside our window, guess what it was? It was a brick wall. So that, that really does hurt the human spirit. Um, and and it, it affected us. It, it affected her mental health, her emotional health, to be able to go outside and play and be a kid again and have a sense of normalcy. So I'm saying the hospital is proposing a, a rooftop garden. Um, seems rather attractive in some way. Um, is it attractive enough, you think? I think it's attractive to adults, but it's scary for children. And it also may be even bad for their health because it's an exposed environment. It's, it's very windy up there on windy days. It doesn't have gentle breezes. It's exposed to harsh sunlight. And that might be um, non-efficacious for a young child who's got issues related to their, to their health issues. It's got perhaps a glass parapet that perhaps gives you some sense of separation from all that commotion that you're hearing, all that noise down in the street. But if you're a kid with vertigo, it isn't working so well for you. And certainly uh, the, what we've seen for the design does not have this immersive space. It's largely covered with, with planking. It's got planters. It's got a little lawn, but it's crowded. People are on their cell phones. They're walking around but they're not really immersing themselves in nature. There's no water up there, and last but not least, there is certainly no grand shade tree uh, providing a peaceful, almost sacred environment for those mm -hmm. who are unwell, who are trying to find some place to feel secure, to feel safe. Mm -hmm. What is it about the tree, Tom? Because, because I, I know it obviously gives you shade, but 
you know, you're out there in a warm spring, summer day, uh, you hear the leaves rustling. I mean, you almost feel like you almost touch all that space that's out there. Well, you, if you're talking about the Prouty Garden Sacred uh, Dawn Redwood Tree, uh, it speaks for itself. And it will be much mourned if and when it ever, ever gets sacrificed. But the idea that uh, a, a green roof, which by, is by no stretch is a roof garden, but a green roof could have a large shade tree like that and provide that is just beyond, uh, is beyond possibility. Right. And that's a great sacrifice. Peter, I, I uh, saw one testimonial uh, about this space from uh, Elizabeth Richter. And, mm -hmm. and you're familiar with that? That was in the Boston Globe. She talked I've about. I've probably read that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, following. I mean, her brother's ashes. Oh yeah, I actually met her. Yeah, yeah. Her brother's ashes are there, and many children's ashes are there, and many children have died there, and many children have lived their whole lives in the hospital. And I think from the outside, it's hard for people to remember. You know, when you think about a hospital stay for a grown-up, it might be a week, and they think, well, what's the big deal, you know? They forget that children's treatment for cancer is very different. It is very intensive, and for Lucy's cancer, they would bring her down to literally death's door and then bring her back up again, over and over again. And, and we forget, you know, you're there for months and months on end, literally living in this space. And, and we are taking away from children accidentally, and I'm not picking on children's, but all hospitals have this challenge where, in a hospital, you can't sleep through the night ever because people are coming in all night long. You can't get really good organic nutritious food unless you bring it in. So, so things like sleep, fresh air, they don't exist in a hospital. And it's kind of one of the ironies of modern medicine is that we're cut off from these things that are the most healing, especially for children. You know, I think that the article by Dr. Um, T. Barry Brazelton brought up some wonderful points about what children need. You know, he is, he is a prominent physician at Children's Hospital. And he really spoke up about the need for children and that the needs of children need to come first at this hospital. Do you remember anything your daughter told you about this garden? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have, I, I'm a photographer um, by trade. And Lucy would have me take pictures of everything out in the garden, every tulip, every flower, every crack in the sidewalk, every statue. But one day we were out there and she had a mask on. And we, she had me take a picture of her toes in the grass. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? She's like, I need you to take a picture of my toes in the grass, because that's who I am. And it, I have that picture, and if you can imagine, it breaks my heart. I mean, Lucy's now gone. She doesn't need a garden anymore, but she desperately needed it then. And I, you know, I'm here not for Lucy, but for the children who are alive now and fighting, fighting to survive. I, I know the campaign is trying to keep in touch with people out there, so if people want to follow up on this, what's the best way to go? Uh, Absolutely. They should go to um, Proudy Garden, well, Save Proudy. Save Sorry, saveproudy.org has all the information, lots of articles and links. Thank you very much, Beecher Grogan and Tom Payne. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come, a musical celebration of black history at Symphony Hall. But first, this message.